Um, today what we're going to do is the second half of that, which is now that we know that there's complexity, now that we know um, how to look at systems, let's think about systems design. I'm going to cover that, then I'm going to take a step back and put everything into context that we've learned, and at the end we're going to do a, a short little a mini assignment here where you guys are going to have to solve a systems problem in whatever time we have left um, at that point in lecture. So what makes computer systems so special? Why, I mean, why, is, why are they so different than a lot of other systems? Well, one of the primary reasons is that the complexity of a computer system isn't limited by physical laws. And in particular, noise doesn't limit uh, the computer system complexity because, the computers, are digi because computers are digital. Um, and we'll actually go through a little example of, of what that means uh, a little bit later on. Second is that technology changes uh, and, and computer system changes at an unprecedented rate. And with this, the interesting thing is that unlike a lot of other systems like uh, planes, trains, or automobiles, uh, our, the technology we build actually helps us build better technology. That feedback loop, if you actually do a little bit of calculus, will actually can give you, will show that, that the result of this is that technology should increase exponentially. The quality of the technology should increase exponentially. These two things make computer systems much more difficult in general than planes, trains, or automobiles, at least the bigger computer systems. If you think about some of the even earlier on, um, uh, Xerox copiers, you know, you think, oh, it's a copier, what's the big deal? They're, um, they're about the size of a Volkswagen. Uh, and they're incredible, and they've been around actually for more than 10 years. They have various ethernets in them. They have something like 10 million lines of code in them. And they're fabulous. They'll, they'll print stuff out at 600 DPI. This was, year, this was about 10 years ago I saw one of these operating. 600 DPI, um, 130 sides per minute, and they will, they'll glue bind these things. And you have this whole system there where you can use to change the doc. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Right? That's a piece, I mean, even though there's physical, a physical aspect to it, there's 10 million lines of code in it. That's a complex system. So how do we manage complexity? Well, I'm going to give you four different ways to think about managing complexity. I'm going to go uh, through each of them in more detail. To a couple of them uh, you've seen, you've, you've dealt with abstraction a lot. You probably have seen a bit of modularity. Uh, hierarchy is one that you read about, and layers is one you, you may or may not have seen. The, the, as we go through these, the trick here is it's not trivial, it's not easy to just be able to say, oh, I know, I'll just use all of them, or I know when to use you know, these. It's going to be the hard part about this is learning when and how to most effectively use them. That's one of the reasons why you want to learn from others' experiences and what the results were so that you can have a better uh, footing to stand on when you actually use them. So modularity. It's also known as divide and conquer. How many of you guys did the Bank Vault program for the interview? Okay, they, if you use divide and conquer, it immediately becomes a lot more easy because you don't have all these, all these different elements to, to deal with. If you haven't heard the Bank Vault program, please ask someone who has. Um, it'll, it's, a fun, it's, a, uh, it's a fun little problem. The idea here is um, you take the components of a system and you group them together into smaller sets of interacting subsystems. Now yesterday we talked about complexity and we talked about five different symptoms. Which dimension of complexity does this reduce? Modularity is supposed to reduce complexity. We talked about different symptoms for what makes a, com a system why it's complex. Which one does, what, how does modularity, which dimension does this reduce? Layers. Pardon? Large number of Say again? Large number of components. Large number of components. So here what we're doing is we're reducing, in a sense, the number of components, quote unquote components, by using modularity. We're grouping things together. Okay? Um, and an example here is a compilation of a large program. And actually, let me write this out. Think about um, a large program like this one I started off talking about, 10 million lines of code. Imagine that there's, you know, there's going to be bugs in this code, and when people find a bug, you're going to have to recompile. All right? Now, the wrong thing to do is to try to recompile all 10 million lines of code. All right? But let's, let's think about why, why that, what the impact of all that is. So if you look at the total number of bugs, 
you can um, you can write that out as the total number of bugs um, so this total number of bugs per lines of code is really the rate at which bugs appear in the code so maybe one uh, you hope it's not one bug per line you hope it's it's a small number and And so, I mean, this is pretty obvious, right? Because these two cancel out. Um, let's look at what, how, much, how long it's going to take to compile that. Well, the compile time is going to be the time to compile, and I'm going to abbreviate here, one line of code, right? That times the total, the lines of, the number of lines of code. Right, and this is how long it takes to compile the whole thing once. But then, for each bug we find, we have to do another recompile. So that's going to be times the total number of bugs. OK, so far, so far, so good. Great. So now let's substitute in and see what we get out. So the total compile time. It's going to equal this, the time to compile one line, All right? And if we substitute this in here, then we say, well, lines of code, lines of code. So let's call this the bug rate. <coughs> times lines of code squared. Okay, so what so what kind of what's the what's the growth rate of this of this uh, what's an order notation of this compile time? Order n squared to the lines of code. Yeah. Order n squared on the line, number of lines of code. Now you have ten million lines of code. That's that's getting kind of nasty. So what do people do? Um, what's what, so if, we, if you look at modularity, modularity says let's let's start grouping these components, which are lines of code, into larger larger components. So let's say that we take, um, that, let's say we group them into k components. So what does that do? Well, that just does that for us, right? Compile time now is divided by k because if we have, for example, k files, um, then we only have to recompile one file. What's the order of magnitude or growth of this? Still n squared, okay? Now. The other thing that you do as, as programmers typically is you say, well, you know, my files aren't going to be arbitrarily large. If, you know, I'm going to probably have, say, a couple thousand lines of code at most in a file, maybe, maybe more like a few, maybe several hundred. Um, so if that's a fixed size, m, so let's say m is the max number of lines of code. In a, in, a, in a file. Now, the, this k is basically going to be m over the lines of code that we have, because we break it up into com the, the program into uh, components of size m. Can you guys all see that from over? So the other way around? I can't read the lines of code divided by m. Okay. Um, yep, yep. <coughs> Thank you. I was getting ahead of myself. If you substitute, right, you flip this around. Yes, question. M, I just can't read. Oh, I'm sorry. M is the maximum number of lines of code in a file, so it's some constant. Say, you know, say you tell yourself, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put, you know, at most a thousand lines of code in any file, because otherwise it's too big. So that's then the minimum k, because they're not evenly files are completely on their size. The case the total number of files is going to be significantly larger. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, but you, you try to fill it up. And, I mean, you, typically, when you write code, you don't have a file that's like three lines. Usually, it's, the, you, you can probably have them average out to between like 800 and 1,200 or something like that. That's, I mean, that's, that's a general idea here. So, but the general idea is that everything's around a constant, right? If we substitute this constant into this, right, then what do we get? Then we get the compile time. 
is equal to the time to compile one line times the bug rate times, and then this, because it's down here, cancels out with one of these. The m goes on top, m time lines of code. Okay, what's the order of growth of that? Somebody, what's, what's your name? I'm trying to get everybody's name. John? John, what do you think the order of growth of this is? This one? This is n or m or n? This. Okay, order of growth of this. Why isn't it m times n? It is, but m is a constant, so it's order this. So now we've gone to some, from something that's n squared to, to more linear. Um, so modularity, this is one of the, I mean, you can actually show mathematically that modularity, how modularity can help you. Um, does everybody understand this, this argument here? How does it decrease the number of components access of complexity? Doesn't it increase that? In well, the components here, the component was a line of code. That was the, that each component was a line of code in this case. It wasn't a care, you know, you could have, you could have defined components differently, but in this case, it's easiest to say, well, it's a line of code because the compiler, you know, sucks in a line, parses it, right? And but but using modularity in a program doesn't decrease neither the number of lines of code nor the number of discrete components. Really, doesn't it increase? It doesn't. The it, of it doesn't decrease the number of lines using modularity, but it, what it does decrease what it does decrease is the overall <laughs> compile time. Okay. So this is the this is the total amount of times. This is this is. Uh, a simplification of the total number of, t of total amount of time that you're going to need to compile this program before you ship it. And that's what category of complexity? The compile time. Yeah. Um, it's not a category of complexity. It's it's a way of reducing the uh, the. I mean, this is an objective. Okay. This is an objective. You want to reduce the compile time, okay. right? and you have and your system is this big piece of code, who's made up of a bunch of components, which are these lines of code. And then so the question is, how do you meet this objective of reduced compile time using modularity to reduce the complexity of the system? And this is, this is one way that you can do that. There's actually a critical assumption that's made here um, that you could use to debunk this. I mean, you're assuming that, that it's, uh, as, as, if, if you compile a smaller part, it's like proportional to, it's, if you compile something that's one tenth of your original. Okay, that's one assumption. That's actually a pretty, uh, you're, getting, you're getting at the right thing. That's a reasonable assumption, but there's, there's, you, you're getting at the right, at the right issue here. I, I don't know, but also you have to link them afterwards, perhaps, but I'm not sure. Okay, that is, you're, getting you're getting warmer. <laughs> you're getting warmer. Uh, can I, I just want to get everybody's names. I'm, uh, Joe. Joe. I'm just confused because if, if you have a bug rate, and it's in, you know, so every 10 lines is a bug, it will say. Okay. No matter how large each of your individual files are, you're just going to have to compile that file that many times to get all the bugs out of it. So it's, I don't see where you're saving. You're saving because you don't have to compile all 10 million lines. But you're compiling all 10 million lines over a period of time anyway because you're going to have to compile each module the same, whatever the bug rate is, that many times. Um, but the, yes, but then you're getting back to the this is when you compile something as you put more code and code into it, compilers tend to do analysis that goes that are that's non-local. These non-local analyses that compilers do, and this is another assumption that that when a compiler does some of these non-local analyses, some of them take exponential time. And so what a compiler does actually, that's why I mean they, the compilers actually like to have smaller files, even though the optimizations aren't as great. But if you try to stuff more and more files into it, you actually have that factor that'll start coming out to bite you. Um, and some compilers will even just say, well, I'm only going to compile one procedure at a time, because they assume that that's small enough that these exponential effects won't, won't grab you. Sometimes if you have a huge procedure, you can throw it into some compilers, and it'll just take forever. And you're like, why is this? And th that's, that's part of the reason why. But that, that's good. That's a good observation. Yes? Uh, Mike. Mike. 
quick question. For the compile time, let's say you have three bugs in your program. It takes three times as long to compile as if you had just one bug. Is that what, is that what you're saying? The second line. For the second line here. The second line. So compile time. Well, the compile time here, this is the total compile time. So let's say, yeah. So This here is the time it takes to compile the whole program once. Yeah. And then you multiply that by the total number of bugs. That's right. Okay, now we're now we're okay. Now we're getting at something. That we're starting to get warmer. <laughs> it's starting to get warmer. Yes. Michael also. Michael. Um, you're assuming that these systems are completely independent, and that there's no you don't have to recompile one to recompile another. Okay, so that that's that, that's pretty close. I think you guys pretty much have it. When you even though you do these modules, even though you you separate these into say files of size 500, when you find one bug. Right? Remember propagation of effect. When you fix one bug, there might be another one that pops up somewhere else. Right? Or maybe there might be a lot of them that pop up somewhere else. Or it might break an assumption in your code. Right? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that could happen. And if you read the Unix haters book, there's actually some interesting examples of why certain bugs have been allowed to continue in Unix. And it's this kind of propagation of effect issue. So, um, so I mean, these interactions between modules are, is the one thing that will that you could use to say, well, this this argument actually isn't isn't you know doesn't really hold in practice as much because in practice you do have this propagation of effect. Nevertheless, this is a this is a nice. Um, I mean, this is in general you do want. This is the reason why you do want to break f uh, large files. I mean, large programs into files because you get a lot of this effect, but you still get bitten by others. Oh, let me let me finish up actually a little bit with uh, modularity. Um, one of the when you're when you're thinking about modularity, I mean, this is this is about compilation. But one of the things that people sometimes do is they try to enforce boundaries between modules to control these interactions. So in some programming languages, for example, you'll have um, you'll ha you'll have to specify, unlike Scheme, you'll have to specify a lot about the interface of each procedure or of each module, which which some programming languages have things called modules. And you'll have to say things like, here's the type of the types of each argument, an integer. Some languages you have to specify what the effects, the side effects of each module is. Does it mutate this? Does it mutate that? Does does it is this something that it outputs or does it? Uh, other languages you have to say things like um, what can be released and what what kind of storage can be released or not. These are all kinds of things that ways that you can enforce boundaries between modules when you're programming, um, and they they can be very valuable because. It allows you to isolate or to try to control the interactions between two different modules. You, th these things usually are done at compile time, so the compiler won't generate code if it sees an error in, in or inconsistencies between these module boundaries. Another thing is um, when you're when you're writing code or when you're doing a system, there's this uh, the robustness principle, which is assume that input can be wrong or outside of the specs or noisy, um, but ensure that all that the output is always within the specs. So the very one of the very first examples of this was um, tolerances and components. It turns out that when when you used to build rifles, people used to have to fit parts together by hand, and this is because you know just every every part came out a little bit different, and you had to maybe sand a little piece here. There's always and so you, it was very time consuming, very labor uh, consuming. Um, what Henry Ford realized is that if you have the idea of tolerance, where you can you specify here's a part. Here's the measurements, and here's the allowed tolerances you can have. This then allowed the parts to be interchangeable, and all of a sudden, boom! You, you had the ad, you know, that led to the advent of of the production lines and cars. A really cool example is is digital logic gates. Have you guys done that? Okay, so you guys have done the the curve, right? Yeah. This, okay, all right. So maybe someone can explain it. <laughs> Who said yes over here? The idea is that a Logic gate will accept a noisy value and output a clean one. So that <laughs> in that transition curve, it will it will understand mm -hmm. from 30 percent higher than than the voltage that's supposed to represent zero and 30 percent lower than the voltage that's supposed to represent one. Okay. And then when it outputs, it will output something much closer to either zero or one. Right. Something like this, whereas the input can be. What kind of gate is this? Mm -hmm. 
flip-flop, it's a not gate, yeah. It's, this is a not, right? Zero becomes one, one becomes, one becomes zero, okay? Um, now, remember at the first slide, I said why computer systems are so complex? Mm -hmm. what, is, what does this do that, that, allows, that, that allows them to be very complex? Much more complex than, than most physical systems like planes, trains, or automobiles. Rob? Okay, well, you do compensate for noise, but well, the noise is reduced at every step. Mm -hmm. Is that there's, there's going to be noise in the system? It's, it's a physical system. Um, but what this does is it reduces noise, and so noise propagate noise is not propagated. It's it's reduced and, and taken care of at each step. So unlike you know a, a if, imagine a car, you know, is it's, it's physical. It doesn't you can't. It's very hard to build components at some level that will reduce you know noise and and however you're measuring it in another piece of it at at some level. Whereas this thing just you know you can build these millions billions of transistors. Put them all together, and the noise if the noise isn't going to kill you, at least not. Um, <laughs> I'll take that back if there's a, if there's a uh, if there's a designer here. By what exactly defines modularity? I mean, all these things we're talking about: modularity, abstraction, hierarchy. There are ways of breaking down the complexity, and from what I'm gathering, it sounds like modularity is breaking it down, irrespective of what is in each. Each yeah, you know, that's great. That's that's perfect segue into the next thing. That's, that's exactly the next, the next issue, which is abstraction. Modularity and abstraction actually go, tend to go hand in hand um, because the question is when you, as, as was brought up, you know, how do you decide where these module boundaries are? Uh, usually you do that um, by, by using abstraction in conjunction with modularity. And abstraction, as you've all learned, is hiding the implementation details behind well-specified interfaces. And the, what you do is you, you choose your abstractions to try to minimize the intermodule interactions. Okay, so here again, abstraction, one of the other symptoms of complexity was lots of interactions between module, between components. Well now we're, if we take modularity to reduce the number of components and use abstraction in deciding where to, where, how to group these to reduce the number of interactions, we're starting to address some of the issues of, that complexity can, can bring upon us. Um, and typically, I mean, typically modularity and abstraction in computer science are just used so, I mean, it's just a no-brainer. People just do it that way. So you usually don't see the two ideas broken out apart. Um, you may see them broken out uh, apart in, in some cases um, with physical systems, but it's, I mean, it's, it, it, there's really, I can't think of a good example at this moment of why. thing that you have to be careful with abstraction is performance. What kind, has anyone, can anyone explain what, why I say that? There's, there's lots of mm -hmm. possible overhead in, say, if you have a piece down here that needs to pass information to a, a piece over here and you've defined a nice <coughs> interface path that goes up like this, but in order to get information mm -hmm. you have to pass it along all these, and up and down all these abstraction layers when you might, when it might be much faster just to shoot it over to, the component that needs it, even though that violates your nice abstraction model. Okay, that's that's a that's a good general description. Let me show you this. Um, give you an example that I mean, think about this when you're reading the uh, the X window system. Um, how many of y'all programmed in X? How many of y'all know what the X window system is, just in in general? Good. Okay, so you can imagine that somewhere in the X window system, you have something like you know create window. Right, and this function probably would take some parameters like you know the x and y coordinates, um, whether it has a border or not, what the colors are. I mean, all sorts of all sorts of stuff, right? Just because the x the windows are very flexible, they're very uh, general, um, and so this is a great abstraction over a bunch of a bunch of code that sits underneath that implements this and libraries, blah blah blah. Now imagine that you are writing a a bit a large system that that the distributed spreadsheets, you know, and so you're running around uh, trying to figure this out. And so one of the things that you have to do as part of this is you have to say, oh, I need to build a spreadsheet. Well, what's a spreadsheet? Well, it's a window with lots of cells, All right? Well, um, you know, each cell is, a cell can take a number up. You're know, like, wait a minute, I could, why don't I just use create window to create a bunch of these cells in here and then I can have 
you know, it's very easy. I have all this functionality over here that I can use to put numbers in or you color the text or do all this, all this stuff. This is a great use of abstraction because now you're getting all this, you know, you're able to abstract away all these nasty details and just use create window and just do a little nice little for loop, you know, for next loop, order n squared, boom, it just comes out. Now, if any of you have done that, <laughs> or some of you may be cringing at the thought of doing that, but if any of you have done that, you know that this will just, this is like the worst thing you can do. This, can anyone take a, a stab as to why? That's right. So each this thing is very general. So it's going to go and create all these data structures, and it's going to have all this overhead. And what do you want? Just text, maybe colored text? That's it. But why do you need these thousands and thousands of lines of code over here to do all that? You're going to take a huge performance hit. It's bad. So abstraction in this case is causing you, it's great because from a modularity point of view, you have this for next loop. But now, what's your alternative if you don't want this overhead? What do you have to do if you don't want to use this create windows function? What's that? Write your own. Write your own. What's your What's Andrew. your name? Andrew. Okay. Got three three uh, out of thirty three thirty five <laughs> chance of getting that. Okay. Um, uh, oh right, you got to write your own. So now instead of this nice little for next loop, you have this horrible you know this this thing that's that just I mean you probably since this is open source you can go in and just and just uh, grab the code and modify it and it's this horrible thing and, and now you're breaking the abstraction boundary. You're making the system more complex. This is a trade-off that's, that's very hard to deal with and that, but that you have to be very careful about when you're designing your system. You can come up with a very beautiful, elegant design that minimizes the interactions between, between modules and, and just feels right, but when you implement it, boom, you get nailed. Be careful with that. Um, if you, want to learn, if you want to read more about that, actually, I did my PhD thesis on how to actually get the best of both worlds in this. Just one approach to doing that. I, I'm still having a hard time seeing how modularity reduces the number of components. Okay. All right. Uh, anything in? Was it, I mean, does it go back to that compilation argument? Somehow? It's because modularity, what you're doing, if you take the number of components and you start grouping them into modules, so that, that's how you, because you start grouping them and start looking at the system as a set of modules as opposed to a set of independent components. So like in the compilation case, you're looking, instead of a, as lines of code, you're looking at it as files. Okay. I think okay. a single like, procedural program. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Okay. Any other questions so far? All right. Hierarchy. So you all read a paper on hierarchy. Um, a bunch of different types of hierarchies. Uh, so you should probably know that this first part here, that the idea here is to organize your modules, in this case, into a tree-like structure. So everybody took algorithms, everyone knows what a tree is. So each node here is going to represent a set of modules that, that interact, and the modules, in this case, are allowed to only interact along the links. So one example of this are businesses. Um, if you take a, corpor a giant corporation like Compaq, there's a CEO who interacts with senior management. There's the, each, each, uh, senior, each person who's in charge of a division, say, in senior management, interacts with their direct reports and so on down the line. And uh, at, at, at some points you have teams, at some points you have just single, single people at the leaves. But in general, that's the structure, that, that structure's there. Now, like the previous example, this, the, the uh, point here is to reduce the interactions from a potentially order n squared to order n. So can anyone, does it, can anyone tell me why, why that is, why that reduction occurs? Now that you know what, what, how, what trees are. Let's see, let's, want to, someone else who, yes? I guess because you only interact with one level up and one level down, while in a structural theory you can interact with anything. Okay, so in a tree, good. All right, if each of these has modules and then basically the, you're, you only interact this way, this way, and within this, this module here. All right, and because of the nature of the tree, you know that you know, most of the tree isn't going to be 
if you distribute it, if you dist assuming you distribute it well, um, in a more or less balanced way, most of the tree isn't going to be in here. And the size of this is going to be, of each one of these nodes, the number of modules in there is something that you're going to want to limit probably by a constant, because if you put too many modules in there, then you're faced back with the same complexity problems. All right, does that intuitively make sense? Any questions on that? Yeah, why don't, why don't you have the daughters of a node interact among themselves rather than create a node with dots inside it? Why don't you have the, mo these are modules in here. Simon's example of a, a room reaching stability of temperature, mm -hmm. the cubicles interacted among themselves. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, a room mm -hmm. interacted with another room. Mm -hmm. So why aren't there inter-sister connections? Um, well, in this case, you mean like this? Well, in an organization like a, I mean, like a business organization, um, at time you don't necessarily want this because there's there's no reason to do it. So assume that this one, for example, is a division that does. Um, uh, the, suppose the way you divide this is geographically. So this one's sell. It's a sales organization in Mexico, and this one is a sales organization in uh, uh, let's pick a Japan. Right, there's, for these two to interact directly doesn't make a lot of sense. Up here where there's, you know, th let's say there's another sales thing. Up here who's the director of sales, say of, of notebooks. There it makes sense to see, well, what's working here, what's working here, and kind of look at it all, decide what, and then kind of propagate back down. But for these two to interact doesn't really make a lot of sense. So that, therefore, you can act, you can, you can organize this, 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 the hierarchy this way. Now, the other side of your, let me, let me extrapolate to the other side of that question. There are lots of different types of hierarchies. There are lots of different ways of using hierarchies, and you've read about them in this, in this book. And as I mentioned before, it's not always clear which one is the right way. So one of the things you have to decide when you're looking at a system and you want to use hierarchy on it is how do I want to organize the hierarchy? How am I going to, you know, how, can I actually do it? Am I going to have to have weak interactions here? Maybe you might. If you might, then that's, it is what it is. Um, yeah, yeah, it is what it is. And, and, and when you design systems, it actually, I mean, if you look at organizations, you will see weak interactions between these at times. And that's fine, but having this as the overall guiding principle will help re reduce a lot of the complexity. Other questions? So you consider hierarchy a special case of modularity? Well, I, I consider hierarchy a way of organizing your, your modules. Um, but so you wouldn't have hierarchy without modules in that computer system? You wouldn't have hierarchy? You wouldn't have hierarchy without modules in the computer system? Um, you could. I mean, you could make these components. I'm just, I'm just assuming that. If you have if you have components, you probably want to organize them into modules to begin with. When to to I mean, in the modules, you'll decide based on the purpose that you're looking at, based on you know the objectives, that kind of thing. But I I'm going to be talking in terms of module. I mean, I'm talking in terms of modules here because I'm assuming that you'll always want to take that step. What's the distinction between modules and components? Um, a component can be, uh, for example, like we were talking about yesterday, a component can be. In the case of a computer, let's say it can be the the disk drive, the the cables that that connect the disk drive to the to the uh, PCI to your PCI SCSI card and the PCI SCSI card that connects to the right. You can modularize that into say, oh, this is and use abstraction to say this is a disk subsystem. Um, but your system could still be all these different pieces, right? Because you might be thinking about, well, my objective is to make the the whole thing go fast. Well, then you have to think about how wide my bus is at some level. So you still want those to think about those components in your system. But when you're thinking about the other side of that disk subsystem, like the interface between the, the PCI card and your motherboard, then you know, maybe you want to abstract this away as a module. So in a, in a programming example, what would modules versus components be? Component maybe um, a component could be a, a set of procedures, and a module could be uh, an, inter an interface to, say, creating and, and modifying Windows. I, okay. I don't see that difference yet. It sounds like module is just a higher order construct. You're talking about modules as made up of components. That's right. A module is a higher order construct. That helps you reduce that, the complexity of a system when you're, when you're looking. That's, mm -hmm. that's the distinction you're making between yes. components and modules? Yes. That's right. Okay. That's, that's it. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Is it fair to think a component is your sort of lowest level of 
Yes. Analysis. The lowest level of, of the system that you that's that's relevant to what your purpose or objective is in analyzing or designing it. Um, a lot of times when you're when you're looking at your system, you'll actually want to look at it different ways at different times, depending on whether you're optimizing certain things or designing other pieces, etc. So layers is an interesting uh, technique. Um, uses modularity and abstraction, and it's just about looking at, uh, at a system a different way. So as an example, um, and as a way, and layers doesn't necessarily add more functionality to the system. It's just a different view, way of looking at it. So one way of looking at this computer is, well, it's a bunch of logic gates and memory cells. At some level, that's, you know, that makes a lot of sense because you might be, let's see, you might be, you know, working at that, you might, you might be thinking about, you know, how, how, what kinds of, uh, well, how much power do I have here, and what, what is my cache line size, and a bunch of different parameters. Um, at some other level, you might say, oh, it's a microprocessor, and it's got these little subsystems in it, um, or modules. There's the, the cache here, the level one cache here, the level two cache here, there's the floating processor unit, and so on. At another level, you think, oh, it's a machine language processor, I can feed it machine language instructions, load register, a with uh, with the number one, or do a comparison and branch if necessary. Um, another level, you can think of it as a Java processor. Well, I put in these Java byte codes and it computes some answer. It, this is all the same machine. You're just looking at it at different layers of implementation. Okay. Yes. Question. No, okay. I was just thinking, at a higher level, you could think of it as a word processor. Um, and if it's if it if the word processor is something like LaTeX, then you're still in, at the same point because <laughs> LaTeX is actually um, Turing complete, so you can actually write you know any program that that you want. Do you guys do complexity yet? Okay, so you know what Turing complete is. Okay. So what else? Well. You know, I've given you these different these different concepts to play with. It's going to take a little while to really to really understand them. It's probably it's going to take you um, actually working with them to to get an intuitive feel if you don't have one already. Um, and and the real question, the thing that you have to learn is how do you pick the right form of modularity, abstraction, hierarchy, or layers? If you looked at the uh, at the architecture complexity paper so we talked about before, there's lots of different hierarchies. There's different ways of organizing them. There's different you know different effects that you get out of that. Um, there's no right one, but this just illustrates the point. If you're given a priori some some system and said turn this into a hierarchy, you have to decide what how to do that. Um, but there are there is some help uh, that you can uh, in in terms of deciding that. There's a couple of different approaches that you can use to try to I uh, help you decide what uh, form of modularity, et cetera, to use. One is called iteration. Second one is called KIS. I took the last S out. <laughs> so iteration. Um, the idea here is you start with a, a really simple working system that meets a few of the key requirements. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Worse is better. It's very much it's very much aligned to that type of philosophy. Um, what you do then, what you do is you, you you use what you learn. You look at you study the system. You use what you learn, and then you evolve it out to to start meeting more of the requirements. Now, it's one of the things that's key here is that you need to make sure that you that you study all the failures, that you learn from your mistakes. You, know, you really work the system, figure out what's what what works, what doesn't, what could be done better. Use that to help you along. The other, one other advantage of this is that you can uh, import new technology as it arrives. So as you know, you know, technology changes so fast, something new comes up, suck it right in. Trade-offs. Well, one of them is, the, is the, what I call the kitchen sink syndrome. And what that means is if you're using this, it's likely that you'll say, oh, well, now that I've done this, let me add some more features. Oh, and now I can add more features. And it keeps evolving, and you never finish. Um, this is something very dangerous, especially if you're going into, if you're going to go, go, go back into um, the software industry and you're going to become a software engineer. Is you know your manager is going to try to make you <laughs> do as much, add as many features as possible, um, and and they're going to keep adding things. So be careful when you're using this approach. You always, when you use this approach, you always need someone, whether it be you or someone else, to make sure that the original design goals and and conception of the system. Are are being kept in are being uh, abided to because otherwise it'll just get out of control. 
Second thing here is that it becomes harder to change uh, your early decisions as time goes on. So a decision, a decision that you made very early on after you start evolving and iterating, it's very hard to go back and make, change one of these early decisions because of propagation of effect. Right? Changing something early tends to have a greater impact on the system than changing some, a decision you made later on. Okay. Next one is keep it simple. Um, and I, I found a couple of these quotes. They're really, I, lo I love them. If in doubt, leave it out. I mean, if you don't know if this feature is going to be useful, or you don't, you know, you're, but you, it's cool, but you're not quite sure, out. Um, according to this approach, uh, Albert Einstein uh, loves simplicity, but not too much of it. I would guess he was alluding to, you know, don't. <laughs> Don't make, you know, you can take Newtonian relativity and reduce it. If you keep reducing it and making it more simple, it'll, it might become uh, Newtonian mechanics at some, at some level. Um, so what, what problems do you face here? Well, it's kind of hard to convince people to, that you want to leave stuff out. So imagine that, you know, you're, you're building some system. Your manager's going to say, well, we need more features. Why do, because if we, if we put this out, even though it's simple, our competitors are going to are going to have more features, and we're going to lose. So, what's what's a company out there that loves throwing features into things? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> loves throwing features into things, and why? Because they think, you know, every that the more features you have, the better. Upgrades, all, I mean, yeah. You, why upgrade to this versus versus WordPerfect? I mean, it's there's all sorts of marketing around that. Um, Another thing, there's a lot of things you have to be careful, but they're all of this type of flavor. Uh, imagine that your manager says, well, we've already, you know, everyone's already tested these features uh, uh, independently on its own. Why do we need to keep it simple? Let's just stick them all together and go with it. What's the problem there? Yeah, well, emergent effects. All right, you put them all together, and this is. Never believe anyone who says, like, oh, we've tested them all independently, and we put it together, and it's just going to work. Because right? you don't know what these emergent effects are going to be. OK, so let's step back a little bit and think about what we've talked about the last couple days and put it all into perspective. So we talked about um, analyzing systems. right? How do we look at systems? How do we think about systems? Um, and the big question is, you know, what are we dealing with? When you're given a system, how do you, how do you put, add structure to what you're given? And we looked at um, you know, what a system is. There's components. There's an interface. There's an environment. Uh, below that, you have to think about what the purpose and granularity is. If you know that, then at least you, you have an idea of the system you're talking about. Uh, but what about? You know, but you have to think about it on a broader scale. So let's think about, for each system, you should also know, you know what problem is it trying to solve? You know, what, what approach is being used to solve that problem? I mean, each system is, is there to solve a problem. There's an approach that was used. There, there's probably the system itself is, in essence, an experiment. You know, what are the results? How can you look at that system and measure it to see to, what metrics can you find to, to see if that system has met its, uh, its uh, objectives? Um, what conclusions can you draw? And what would your next steps be? Um, we also looked at a, a complementary framework um, last uh, in the, the what I sent out last night, which is, you know, before you before you respond to anything, you should know what assumptions are being made here. You know, what are the objectives of this thing? What are the trade-offs that are being made? And we also looked through a set of objectives. There were something like eight, and there yesterday there were speed, robustness, availability, fault tolerance, etc. If you use this, this framework here, um, at the, if you understand these free, the system, you'll be in a really good place to start debating real issues and not going into some kind of Wild West type thing. Where, right? And these are the kinds of things that you should try to get up front before you respond. Um, we also looked at, in terms of analyzing systems, what do we look for issues? When someone says, what do you think about you know, the scalability of, of, this, you know, of this system? Um, you know, look at there's, there's three different, at least three different places you can look for that: the emergent effects, propagation of effects, and commensurate scaling. So this, this is a framework that you guys should use ongoing, not only for your own reading, but also remember later when you're discussing uh, in recitation section 
think about things this way. This will help you focus. So on the one side, you have some more of analysis and critical thinking. On this side, you have more of you know, design issues. And when you're starting to do your final project, this is, these are the kinds of issues that you should think about when you're, when you're considering what you're going to design and what people are going to ask you about it. Questions so far? OK. So let's go back to this. Can airplanes really fly? Now that we've, we've looked at all this, let's, let's uh, have somebody explain why, take a crack at why this is not true. Yes? Thrust. thrust, OK. So what about thrust? Okay, now the, that, that's, an, that's an interesting point. Unfortunately, at this point, when, when people were arguing this, there was no such thing as a jet engine, and you know, this, this whole like, putting a propeller thing was, was pretty new, too. Are there any other arguments that you could make besides thrust that could support this? I mean, because back then, I mean, you saw these funny flying machines that people would build, right? They would look at birds, with birds flap their wings, they thought, well, that's how it works. Uh huh. Yes. Two things. You're not taking into account different designs, different. I mean, obviously, an airplane isn't a bird. It doesn't act like a bird. It doesn't do okay. anything like birds. It doesn't operate based on the way a bird operates. And the other thing is, it doesn't. It says larger flying machines, but it doesn't say how much larger. I mean, maybe if you made a kite out of exactly the same materials that was the size of the World Trade Center, it wouldn't fly. So well, this, this is getting interesting. Kites. OK, it's <coughs> nice. Um, the first assumption that rate grows to the Q of the size can be overcome. OK, so and how do you change the density? So change the density, OK. OK, we're getting. Uh -huh. The fact that it, it says it grows as a cube of size implies that we're assuming that it's solid and that it's filled. OK. OK, so good. Good. So now, now we're actually getting, we're getting to something, something nice and crisp. So let's put all three of these things together. Kites, mm -hmm. you know, structure. I mean, kites were, have been around for quite a while, right? Is there a way that you could use kites to prove this wrong? Anyone fly kites? You, I mean, kites are great, right? You throw them up and. Yes? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about hang gliders is it comes, you can't, um, I mean, hang gliders, you depend on air currents, right, to, to keep your, to propel yourself. Whereas, you know, you throw a kite up and it just, you know, it pulls you, there's actually, you know, real, real energy pulling you up from that without, I mean, so, okay, because of the, okay, it's because of the wind. Okay, hand gliders will work that way too, but if you, if you had a kite, I mean, they didn't have ultralight materials back then, right? They had wood and metal, right? So, in, in theory, yes, but let's, I mean, a kite is something that they had back there. Okay, so I, go with me here. <laughs> it's like the, kite. It's like the effects of wind is the dominant effect on a kite, not gravity, whereas a plane, gravity is more dominant than wind. Okay, so wind is used, the, the, the kites use the wind for it's thrust. Like a feather versus dropping a brick. Okay, so that, okay, so that, so how can you use this idea? I mean, there's wind that's providing the thrust, there's kite, there's this notion over here that, that volume and mass aren't necessarily related. So think about, you know, you're flying a, how can you show this just by using kites? Mm -hmm. A kite is a kind of attempt to be as close as possible to a series of planes rather than a, rather than, you know, some kind of cubic object. Okay. Kites. They're tubular kites that uh, are not don't have a large surface area relative to the, the volume. I mean, okay. So this is starting to sound. So, what kind of kites? Yes. Well, it's also. I mean, the pull of the kite is much greater than the weight of the kite. I mean, that's why it's pulling you up. So mm -hmm. obviously, it can support much more weight than itself. That's why it pulls you. When you're pulling it. Okay. So let's let's think about that. So if we put two kites together, right? Well, how much how much pull are we adding? Roughly, double. Roughly double. And how much how much weight are we adding? Double. Are you sure? Why double? Because they're because they're. <laughs> okay. So you have double. Pardon? The weight of some connecting material. Well, if one kite can fly, then. Then the ratio of 
pole to weight is in favor of pole, so doubling it is going to double the favor. I mean, the mass is doubled, but the weight is there. Okay, now start thinking about, now start thinking, that's right, so now start thinking about, about like, this, this is actually what, what someone did, is they th thought about box kites, right? And you have these box kites, and imagine you start connecting these box kites up, and what do you need to connect them? Well, you know, almost, you don't need very much. And you know that there's, that these things can support a lot of weight. So if you start connecting a bunch of them together, right, then this, this thing, this myth here is debunked, right? Because you have, you can scale that up in a way that doesn't require the scaling of, of that, that, that grows, that allows you to grow the, the, the tug, the pull without, and, and allows you actually to add more weight along the way too. So this is, this is the kind of, I mean, see, this is the kind of, of thinking like this that, you know, it's not trivial, right? But it's, and it took, a lot of smart people believe this, um, but this is the kind of, you know, there's usually this little aha or like a little experiment that you do or that, that actually gets you, gets you over the, the hump. Aren't you assuming that, that the wind interacts with something 12 times as large the same way it does something that's just one unit? <clears throat> um, if you add a bunch of these kites together, though, right? I mean, there's... Right. But, but, but you're assuming the wind still... Interact, that the wind yes. No, no, you're right. Forces. You're right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But the, the point is that people did this experiment, right? They put a couple kites up, they put more kites up, and they showed that, you know, you could have more and more mass flying up there. And, you know, from there you can say, well, maybe we should actually start thinking about this, not, not believing this, and start thinking about ways we can design gliders or planes or something that will, that will actually fly. I mean, this, this whole, the problem with this argument here is, is from, what I, from what I read, I mean, this thing stifled aeronautics for a while, this type of argument. And unstifling it and letting creativity come out was what was needed. And some, a simple experiment is all you needed to, to get over that. But now let's, let's do something a bit more complicated. So, and let's use what we've learned so far, and this is going to be a <laughs> class participation effort. Um, you know, Joe Schmo comes over and says, you know, Joe Airline comes over and says, I want you to help me. I just bought, you know, a bunch of planes and, and a bunch of uh, space at, at different airports around the country. And I want you to help me design my traffic grid. And he says, okay, if I look out there, there's basically two types of grids. There's the hub and spoke system and there's the sort of what I'm calling multi-stop traffic. So let me describe to you what those are. Hub and spoke, um, does, anyone, does anyone actually know what that system is? Uh, Rob? It's like the Delta system where most of the flights go to down in Atlanta. Atlanta or, or, or some, Chicago. or Chicago for United, um, good, Houston Continental. All right, what about this other one, the, the multi-stop? I couldn't figure out the best name for it, but who's, there's, there's another airline in particular that uses a very different Southwest. system. Southwest, okay, tell me what they do. <laughs> okay, great. Now, can someone tell me um, which airline the, the head of the, the CEO of American Airlines hates the most? Southwest. Southwest. Why do they hate Southwest? They have lower prices. Yeah, they have lower prices. All right. Okay, why do they have lower prices? We don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Yet. There's, there's actually a lot of business reasons, but one but proposal, one proposal, one reason might be that it's although it's certainly less efficient for the traveler to do that yeah, bouncing down like the country that. from the perspective of, of fuel and and mm -hmm. expense to operate the aircraft, it might be much more efficient. So. Yeah, I mean, there's you can probably imagine there's you know different things like um, I mean, well, well let's we'll, we'll go into some of that. So th that's the background, right? There's both of these things exist. They're both, you know, they're both commercial. They bo they're both around. Um, what are objectives? Well, what you have to decide is uh, you have to be able to get market share. You have to show how you can get market share, and you have to show how you can lower the costs. Those are the two object, the two key objectives. There's a lot of other ones, but those two have to be optimized. Um, here's a, a set of assumptions that that Joe Airlines is going to give you. There's a fixed delay between an air, airplane landing and taking off, just as a simplifying assumption. Uh, the average flight is two hours long, given the, the layout is traffic grid. Um, so 
what I want, so in the next, say, um, 15 minutes, let's start working this thing out. And at the end of all this, we're not, certainly not going to get done to where we could give an answer that would be the, you know, the best answer. Um, but I want to take you through this, and I want you guys to, to figure out, and I want one of you guys at the end to tell me you know, which one you would recommend and why, based on what we figured out here. So let's start off with the assumptions. Um, what are, there, are, are these all the assumptions you need to, figure, to, to come to a reasonable recommendation, or are there others? Oh, good. OK, hold on. Assumptions. Don't forget the obj what the objectives are here. OK, raise your hands if, you, if you've, yes. That the, there's enough runways and air traffic controllers to do all the flights in one OK, let's write all these down. Runways. <laughs> What's that? Air traffic controllers. <laughs> Okay, so you need enough. Um, and is that, but that's, that's a concern, but what, is, what, what, what do you need to, what kind of assumption? Are you making the assumption that there are enough? Is that what we should do? Well, you need to know what the limits are. Okay. <coughs> All right, so needs, needs, need to understand. Okay, now that, let's, write about, let's write about six or seven down, Sharon. Okay, so plane maintenance, parts, labor, center. Okay, um, well, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Are we carrying passengers only? Can we carry cargo at night? Okay, passengers versus cargo. Yes. Oh, that was, yeah, the same one? Who else? Um, yes. How many planes have we got and how much capital? And I think you could take the first one a little bit more focused by saying the landing slot, the city that you're going to service. And the, and the first one, runways and ATC, I think it's really a question of landing slots in a city you're going to service. Okay, so landing slots. And then this is this is how much money you have, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. How many pilots and stewardesses? Pilots and and flight attendants, right? Where's the money? All right, others. Yes. You need to know something about the demographic, whether they're going to be willing to pay $10 less and have four hours more air travel. Remember, rack face. Like Dollars versus, versus uh, time. Okay, yes. We probably need to know what kind of, it, in line with demographics, what population you're servicing. If you're just servicing people within states, you know, that are doing local travel, that's going to make a big difference. Okay, type of travel. National. Travel local versus non-local. Let's take two more. Yes. Seasonal and special event varies. One more, yes. This is kind of like plane maintenance, but it's you know, is it more wear and tear on a plane to land and take off than just fly? Because then you're going to need to repair, you're going to be spending more time repairing planes than land and more than city. Okay, wear and tear on planes. We also have to consider the cost of loading and unloading. Snuck it in, huh? <laughs> <laughs> cost of loading, unloading. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. Do you think that, let's look at this list. What's wrong with this list? What's that? Well, for 10 minutes is great many points. <laughs> <laughs> it's way too many. This is way too complicated. I mean, look at this thing. What, let's pick, the, what, are the, what are the top ones here that would help you come up with some answer? Number of planes. Number of planes. 
Okay, number of planes is important. What people like is pretty important if you're doing yeah. the Okay, so we can turn this, turn some of the demographics, some of these things into the um, into service, type of service. Yeah, so this is what, I think this is what that, that's like, that's saying is what type of service, so you know, you know how, how local versus non-local, um, that type of thing. What else? Pick one more. What's the, what's the, if these two are, pick a third one. Say, say. Party constraints. Pardon? You know, how much dollars, how much caps do you have? How much, how much money, how much money you have? Is that, do you think yeah, that's the? Maintenance? Um, general facilities? Um, well, let's, let's, let's look back at this. Market share and low cost, right? We've got um, market share. Which ones of these? So type of service is going to help us a bit with market share, right? Um, and how are we going to do anything about the low cost? What's that? What do we need? What's, that? What's an interesting thing to know here? Okay. Cost per flight and number of flights. Good. Cost per flight. I think that's so the cost associated with flights. Okay, good. So these kinds if we knew these kinds of things, they would I think they would go towards towards helping us. Is there anything that is there any kind of analysis that we can do that to compare these two types of the hub and spoke and multi stop without even knowing these things? How many flights someone would Okay. Well, let's let's look at. Um, yeah. Well, let's. I mean, let's let's look at let's look at the the structural differences between these two hub and spoke and multi stop. And one of the things that was. Let's look at, without even knowing what they are, let's take these as sort of as variables, you know, cost of associated with flights. Okay, when it, what's the cost associated with a flight? Uh, let's look at the hub and spoke system. Let's assume that we have one hub. So what generally happens? Let's, let's think about how this system works. What generally happens when, when in the hub and spoke system? You've, you guys have, who have flown. <laughs> okay, so, and, but what about the timing between these flights? Usually they're late anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Actually, that's a huge disaster for these guys, right? For that hub and spoke. Um, but what I mean, what happens? These it's these guys all fly in like at the same time, roughly, right? They're all timed to fly in at the same time. Everyone kind of switches, and boom, everyone flies out. Yeah, so how many flights right? can you get in and out every day? Yeah. How many flights can you get in and out every day? There's so there's some considerations, of, uh, like for example, the ATCs and runways and all that, but. You know, assume that that the reason this guy bought these things, right, was because he was smart enough to know that he had enough runways and ATCs, because otherwise you wouldn't buy a plane and, and the rights to a certain flight. Um, so, but but let's just look at the structural. Ver so everyone kind of flies in, everyone kind of runs around, everyone flies out, right? Mm -hmm. So how much, in terms of what what's the what's the cost of of people flying in? Um, well, there's a you know the plane landing and landing fees and all that stuff. What's another? So there's um, landing, you know, airport fees. Is it the cost of taking off the fuel cost a significant portion of the fuel cost per? Depends on the length of the flight, mm -hmm. right? If it's a short flight, it's. I mean, but let's just let's just look at what happens when everyone flies in. You pay for the you pay airport fees. What else? What else do you pay? What's a big piece of what you pay? Fuel. Fuel. Well, fuel, but you know, planes. Planes, you know, take off, land. You have oh, to yeah. pay the fuel. The What's that? To service the plane. When it lands. Okay, so service the plane. What else? And that involves what? Cleaning the plane after. That involves people, right? Yeah. Okay, so you have a huge people cost. Sorry, I'm using a different color. Although the people cost is probably less with the hub and spoke because you've got the economy. Uh, uh, well, let's 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 think about that. People cost. So um, let's just draw a quick graph. 
What's the um, what's the number of people? So so what's the the uh, how do you determine how many people you're going to need there? You need x number of planes, and you need since all the planes are coming in together, you need it just goes linearly up. Okay, so you need enough people to handle the the, the maximum number of of people that are coming in at once. Yeah, because all the flights are in at the same time. So if you need x per plane, if you need four people per plane, you need four times the number of planes. But you can schedule the ship. Yeah, so I mean, in this system, what happens, I mean, the assumption here that we're making, a simplifying assumption, everybody flies in, right? Everyone switches, you know, has an hour to switch around, then everyone flies out, right? Then the cycle repeats at some point. You know, those flights drop people off, then they pick more people up, and then they fly back in, they drop people, and then they fly back out. This is just like a, a one. So what is the, um, what is the, the required utilization look like? Of people. Good. Right? Mm -hmm. This is when the people come in, right? This is the peak when everybody's there, and right? And what do you? And how? What, what kind of? Uh, and when you staff this, how? What do you? How, how many people do you need to staff this you with? You have to staff to peak. Do part-time workers come in for three hours? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pardon? Could you try for an out of phase curve? <laughs> There's lots of tricks you could try, but I mean, it, this is. But they they also cost money, and you have to figure. You know, it makes things a lot more complicated. And there's a bunch of tricks that I don't even. I I, I won't claim I know, but I know they play a lot of tricks to try to to try to. But it, but I mean, this is this is Joe Airline, right? This is a new guy. He's got some planes. This is what he's faced with with, with hub and spoke. What about the um, what about the multi stop? For what's the number of people that you need? You're going to need at each each stop. I mean, maybe you have like a couple coming in, a couple going out. Okay, and and these things are coming in. Like you're, who was saying that they were just you know you fly everywhere in between, or you can stage these, right? If you're flying from LA to Seattle, right? You know, you send one. You know, it's very easy to stage these, stage these at a finer granularity than it is to do the hub and spoke thing because the hub and spoke thing right you have you may have someone coming from way over here and someone coming from over here but yet everyone has to show up at a time when they can you know run around and go to the next to the next outgoing flight whereas over here you can stage it at whatever granularity is best for that so what is what does the curve does the utiliz utilization curve look like this it's probably it's probably more flat right and it's probably Lower, right? At each particular place. At each particular, uh, yeah, overall. Because here you have a hub, so it's, right? Um, so, and what do you, and here again, you have to staff to peak, right? So, what does this tell about our labor costs in the two different systems, in the two different ones, right? Where's the waste? We're gonna, Right? Question. Times the number. That, and this times the number of hubs, this times the number of, of stops. It seems to me as though it's a very, one of the advantages of the hub and spoke, though, wouldn't be an operating cost at all. It would be in, in set up an infrastructure, which must be an enormous part of the business. The fact is, if you are one of these big airlines and you create a hub, you know, you don't have to deal with the business of constant negotiations of landing fees at somebody else's airport. I don't know whether these guys own the airport themselves, the hub, or. Mm -hmm. Whether they're just the prime leaser, but there must be economies of scale in the infrastructure and set up. Yep, that's right. So there's, uh, that's right. Question. Are we assuming that of the kind of stop that along the way has sort of more stops that are more important than others? Because if they don't, then you, you sort of have to replicate a maintenance infrastructure for critical maintenance. That's right. Multiple times. Right. There's a lot. Yeah, go ahead. Well, it just seems to me that if you took the smaller wave, and then you multiplied it by, you know, stopping at 10 cities along the way, way you're still going to wind up with the same amount of waste except distributed over a greater area. Is it? I don't know. Is that? I don't know. I mean, if you, if you have, you know, if you, if you have 
10 stops to go from one city to another. The, the reason I wouldn't make that assertion is because that, that's the, I, I would argue that that may or may not be true. And it might not be true if these stops or places are smaller airports that, you know, in, in areas, different types. I mean, here you're di talking about Houston, um, big cities, right? San Francisco, sh Chicago. You know, the differences in labor pool here versus here might be, might offset something like that. Yeah. You're, you're still hopping. <clears throat> Flight patterns are still going to land in big cities at terminating points. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have an uh, order of magnitude sized labor cost like the hub system at some point in the flight. Well, you, well I mean, in, if you're landing one every so often, why wouldn't it look like this if you're in a major city? You're pumping these guys out to Seattle, say, right? right? And you're not pumping in a whole bunch of them from everywhere. You're doing this. You know, right. if you, well, you just said you're talking big cities like Houston. Oh, they're, they're, okay, we were talking about the big hub and spoke. Big labor costs. The, the, the hopping system is going to still incur big labor costs like that at big cities. The same as yes, but, but the thi because you have to staff at this level versus this one, then you, then you can save on that. I mean, wait, let, me, let me step back a little bit before. Now, this isn't a proof that one system is better than the other. Okay, this, the, the point here is to show that, I mean, Here's one way to jump into it is to go boom and start like, right? But if the, in, in the real world, you're not going to have it's all the time that you need to look at every single possibility and think about every single thing. You're going to have to very quickly start thinking, well, what are, the, what are the critical aspects of the system that I need to look at and use those as a way to try to focus my design? Now, this is an example in a way of iterative design because here we have you know, a very, one way of characterizing the system. We have um, it's a very it's a simplified one that meets that, that that meets some of these objectives right market share versus low cost cost here market share because we can pump people out you know all, lots of people uh, all over the place along the way um, and and it you know it makes a lot of it makes a lot of sense at this level there's a lot of different roads you can go down there's a lot of different things you'll probably want to know um, which relate to this some of which someone may have done an analysis on some of which they may have not. But the point is here, be careful about jumping into, into something like this. If you feel yourself when you're, when you're coming up with an answer to one of the pay questions that I give you, um, when someone asks you to, to analyze a system, try to take it, try, to, try this approach first. Take one aspect of it, something that, that you can actually, that, you, know, anal you can analyze, you can, you can push forward if you want to, that's an important aspect that, that actually addresses the objectives. Start there and then see where that takes you. What that'll help you do is prune this. Like maybe if you push this forward, some of these here matter more than others, and that allows you to narrow down what you actually need to know, what you don't need to know. Try to structure the way that you, that you approach these things that way. Try to be, you know, start off at the high level. Does that make sense, that, that, that point get across? Now this is a fun problem because, I mean, there's people who think about, th these airlines have people who think about these kinds of things and who constantly, I mean, we're talking about the, the phase shifting and do all sorts of things to try to, to make these uh, schedules so that you don't, to minimize these down here. But what's true out there is that there's an airline that uses this that's very successful. There are airlines that use this that have been somewhat in turmoil. Some of, some of them have gone out of business some of them have merged to try to improve their econom economies of scale. But they're both, they're two systems that work that, that have different objectives that meet different criteria. So again, there's no wrong or right, but if when someone asks you to design it, you, know, the, you, you have to think about what you can learn from these two to come up with your recommendation. So um, can someone come up with a recommendation, either one of these? And you know, choosing either one, either this model, the hub and spoke, or the the uh, multi stop, uh, and tell me why they think that's the right one based on on the very little information that we have here. <laughs> <laughs> this amount of simplifying itself. You have to be, yeah, yes, a brave soul. <laughs> going solely based on the experiences that we can see currently in the airline industry, if our objective is low cost. We would want to follow the model Southwest does. We don't fly out of Logan and JFK. Instead, we fly out of Providence and MacArthur and these smaller fields that have lower cost, that lower maintenance costs, lower airport fees. And we follow that model because history has shown which of those models, currently anyway, is more successful. So we base our potential success on the success of things we've seen beforehand. Okay. What do people think about that? 
Yes. Well, it, it seems like basically Thank what you. we want to do exactly on what is sort of out there in the market and what people are doing might be sort of exactly the wrong approach, right? Because if it's, you know, it, it may be sort of, if, I mean, obviously, like, you know, United and Delta and airlines like that are starting to kind of kind of tumble based on this model. But, you know, if like five years down the road, you know, those, those large airlines have all failed and sort of, sort of every airline is out there in the market, you know, they may be able to offer much cheaper fares doing this sort of, you know, jumping around system. But then that sort of that market of people who are willing to pay a little bit more for the convenience of not stopping, you know, in their flights, it might be a more sort of elite market. But if no one's meeting that, it might be a much better business model to go there. Okay. Now, you have to be careful with that type of argument. The type of argument that was given over here was one based on history. Like history, you know, has shown this to be true. And of course, we all know that the his, you know, past performance is no guarantee of future results. But the argument you gave was very speculative. So you gave, you know, what if this and what if that and what if this. So you have to be very careful about that because, I mean, as we saw yesterday, what ifs are easy to knock down and easy to, to disbelieve. So if you give a what if, you have to back it up with why you think that's more likely. Yes? You could, give a, you could try and make it a bit more um, specific by speculating that perhaps the multi-stop approach, one of the reasons it might work for Southwest is because not that many people were doing it. Yeah. But if there were wide-scale adoption of that, there would be more takeoffs and more landings. Therefore, the average landing fees, the things that Michael was talking about, using low-cost airports, low-cost landing and so on, the industry average would be driven up. And there'd be more people, more competition within that model. Maybe one of the reasons it succeeds now is because there's not that much competition within that model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's, I mean, but, but the thing is that that doesn't necessarily debunk what he said. It's another, you know, you're speculating again. We don't know for a fact that if there were more, more airlines that these costs would increase. Maybe it would improve the economics of scale at these small airports. It's unclear. The thing that the, the thing that you know he made a statement which he said basically saying past I'm going to bet on past performance as a as a as a, as a so, somewhat of a guarantee of future results. Now the thing that you should come back with when he says that is to ask him, well, what are, can you outline the three key risks that I'm going to face by doing that? Because whatever approach you use, there's going to be risks. This gets back to the trade-offs, right? If you if you say you should if you make a recommendation or you make a point about something, you should understand what the other side is. So why don't we ask them what are the three key risks of doing that, going through that approach? Um, I'm assuming that the larger airlines stay with hub and spoke. If they if everybody decides to switch to this, then their economics of scale are going to squish it. Okay. Does do people think that's a big risk? What do you think? Well, I just think it's difficult because this is not based on the analysis that we've done. We're basing on other factors, and there's a lot of questions in my mind. You know, how long has Southwest been making these profits? And I think it's difficult to make a really good decision. It's always difficult to make a really good decision. That's the whole point about systems, mm -hmm. is that it's always difficult. And so the problem that you have to do here is you have to is you have to step up to the plate and say, I'm putting my my flag in the sand here. And I'm never going to know what the right answer is because by the time I do, it's already been done. You know, it's 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 too late. And I mean, if someone can if someone can tell you if someone walks into your office and says, "I'll build your," you know, you're doing a startup, "I'll build your system," and I guarantee you this is the right decision. Yeah. I mean, you're you'll never believe them. Market shares, you, I would want to take a look at their market shares. I mean, we just and their customer energy about long haul. There, yeah. yeah. There, there's there's a whole set there's a whole set of things that you'll have to look at. If you're in the real world, you may have a week, you may have a month. I mean, I've been on, on, on studies at McKinsey where they say in one week you have to cut 20% uh, of, of the workforce of an 80,000 co person company. One week, right? I mean, this stuff, it isn't, I'm not, you know, th this kind of thing actually, I mean, it's great if you have all the time in the world. You can live in an ivory tower, but the world isn't an ivory tower. At times you have to make, you have to decide where you're going to draw the line. And the and the the point that you, that I'm trying to, get, to make here is that give, you have to think of you have the way that the, the only thing that saves you from this is you have to be able to put some structure into the way you think and to put some backing into it to think about what the risks are and then to and then to go with it and take that risk. Yes. I think the disagreement they're having is that we just spent however long doing an analysis based on our people cost. Mm -hmm. And that Michael's argument really didn't bring that in at all. Okay, let's let's. That's a good point. So let's. So why don't you ask him about? Why don't you ask him about that? <laughs> How does that play into? Uh, well, 
what I would say, what we did in the last 10 minutes is totally bogus. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it's very easy for me to, to very quickly look at what Southwest has done. I have no idea if they're profitable or not, so I'm making that up. But if they are profitable, if I can see that, and I believe they are successful, that's very easy for me to go back to and say, there's this large body, besides the 10, besides the 30 of us talking about something we don't absolutely know. <laughs> okay, about. okay. So you're, basi you're, you're basically saying, I could easily find that information, and, and if it turned out to be that it was inconsistent with what I was saying, I could, you know, I could, I could move on to something, to a different thing. Okay, that's, that's a pretty good response. Yes? Okay, so supporting what Michael said, based on what we've been talking about, we can see here that, you know, based on our charts here, that the proportion of where if you, you know, multiply that by the number of air, airports where you have to do this, you're still going to have a much lower proportion of waste, so your total labor costs are going to be most likely lower. So that, I guess, would support the multi-stop traffic from that one perspective. Yeah, you could do a little analysis to, to make that point, you know, to actually bring that point to bear. You would have to do it because someone will question you on, the, on, those, on those numbers. But, it's, but that you can do, right? That's, that's, not, that's an easy thing to do. Yeah. Yes? We only, for the hub and spoke model, we only analyze the cost at the hub. There's all these spokes that are going to have lots of waste because you're going to have one plane flying in, and you have to staff for that, and then the plane flies out, and then... Wait, so, so well, elaborate. There's going to be a lot of waste at, at the spokes. Um, so oh, at the spokes of the hub and spoke oh, system. Because you have to have all these airports. That, I mean, your planes are going to fly out and land somewhere, presumably, and then fly back. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hope. You hope. You had a, you had a response to that? Um, there's just the way I'm thinking of it, but it seems that the multi-stop, you sort of have that same problem too because there's still going to be airports in the multi-stop where you hardly ever go. Right. So I would think of it more as assuming you have maybe you have roughly the same number of small stops but then the hub and spoke you might have like I don't know 15 medium sized ones as opposed to two or three big hubs. See, see, what, see the, if you look at what's going on here it, 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 you guys, you guys, if you guys, if you guys are listening to what was going on here about the <laughs> spokes, right? The the key here, the thing that 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 wasn't being the implicit thing was what is the model that we're going to use for the spokes, right? And so, but, you know, if you guys are are debating, you know, how much it's going to cost, you should first figure out well what's the model and what assumptions are we going to make over there, and then you can be on the same page about you know where why is it this type of of you know what does that graph look like? So you know. Be careful again. Under, make sure you understand what where you all are before you st before you d start debating. It's easy to jump into the debate. But it's usually hard to st sit back and start thinking about you know what are we debating about. Okay, but those that is that is a, v a very valid aspect of this is you know th your original point, which was well, there's a hub, but there's also the spokes. We haven't even looked at them yet. It's not that different in terms of labor costs. I, I agree. It doesn't seem like it seems like you save a, a ton on maintenance and whatever because all your planes go through a given spot. And, and they can take care of what they need to take care of there. But I, I, I don't see a labor advantage so much. Anymore. Well, well, once you decide on a model, the thing that you have to decide on is what are the key, what are the key contribu contributors to the cost there, mm -hmm. right? So they might be different in the hub than they are at the spoke, right? But decide what those are and then say, I, let, I propose that these are the three. And then once you decide what they are, then it's easy to do an analysis on it. I mean, the way, let me just, I'll, I'll get to your questions. One thing that I'm, that I'm getting at here that you see is, it's very, it's very good to come up once you're debating. One thing, what you can feel, feel really good if you come to a point where you've decided that your decision rests on a set of analyses that you can do, right, in the amount of time that you have, right? That's really, I mean, that, when you're designing something, that's where you want to be. You don't want to be in a point where you're speculating and, you know, my thing is better than your thing, and that, that, that's not, that's, that's a disaster. Get to a point where you decide what are the key what are the key factors that I need to analyze. What are the what are the analysis that I'm going to do, and then you go do them, and you come back, and you've already, in a sense, you know, pre-decided where it's going to go. There's always going to be fuzziness in that, but that's at least you're getting something done that's going to help you get closer to your to your answer. Um, there were two questions. One was here. We just don't know, or I have no idea if it's one of the main causes. 
this could be the whole analysis that's in, it's not the big thing if there are 100 guys who make $5 per hour waiting for the that's right. five right. That's right. And so that's one of the assumptions here was that the, the labor was uh, a cost. And I actually read some article about this, this a similar type of analysis. And labor tends to be a big cost at, at airports. Yeah, at, at least at least you know at that point, I, with the economy changing, who knows? Maybe. Uh huh. Um, in this particular case, we did the analysis more at looking at the objective of low cost, mm -hmm. and with more analysis, we can figure out which one is low cost. So that's something doable. But once we have done that and say we picked the multi-stop traffic as the low cost one, we have to look at our other objective, which is market share, whether people will be happy Good. to handle this. And yes. That's the big risk I'm doing in this case yes. Because this might not favor this. That's right. And that's a that's a very good point. We started. We talked about it a little bit, which was um, I thought the most salient comment was this one right here. There's one thing, one type of analysis that would help you determine that. I think this one is the one that's that's most salient. Is how much money are you willing to? How much money does it cost to get you to go from a very you know two stop you know go to a hub come back to one where you have to stop everywhere along the way? And that's some that's some number that you can actually you know go out and research. Uh -huh. I think the the question of whether your people are flying locally or long distance is, is also really relevant because I often find that the hub system is less convenient for the flying that I've done because you have to fly and if I want to go to you know Portland to Seattle I have to go to Houston and then back to Seattle. Right. <laughs> that's right. I mean, so if they're local flights. So. Right. Yes. I mean, just to think of this question along with what you talked about earlier in terms of modularity, the, probably the best way to have done this would be, okay, we have two objectives, market share and low cost. You know, a few people are going to handle market share, a few people are going to handle low cost. They're going to come up with how they're looking at cost in terms of one aspect is labor, one aspect is infrastructure, mm -hmm. kind of come up with the recommendation, then the two groups would meet together and because they each had a separate module, and then could weigh which one's more important in terms of their... Welcome to McKinsey. <laughs> 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 uh, that, and that, that would work quite well, um, I think. I mean, it's given the, what you need to learn here, that's, that's, probably, that's, probably how, you know, that's probably how I would approach it. There was another question over here. I don't know if I got to it earlier. No? Okay. So um, I'm going to close up. The, uh, the, oh wow, we're a little over. The, um, so again, the main points here are it's very likely that you know, you're going to be given, asked to come up with recommendations on th and designs that where you're not going to know, you know, you're not going to have enough to know the answer, but yet you're going to have to put your, you know, your, your, you're going to have to put a stake in, in the ground and be able to defend it. That's very hard for some people to do. It's very easy for other people to do. Um, and it, but the, but the, the real thing you want to get out of it is to learn from it. That should be your objective. Learn from the way others present. Learn from the way from others' experiences, from the papers. Um, the thing not to do is if you show up in recitation and you say and you say, well, I didn't know enough. You know, there's not enough in here for me to make a you know to come up with one side or the other. That's not going to work because that's not. I mean, in the real world, that that's no answer and, and that's and that's no good. Um, have fun in recitation. Um, that I posted the, the assignment for Sunday um, on the uh, website. If you have any questions, uh, go to the B board or go to uh, the TAs.